The takeoff data in the operations manual and the flight planning and performance manual are based on a dry runway with all equipment operating at the start of takeoff. Data is also provided for wet or contaminated runways and for cases where equipment is inoperative or deactivated. The effects of these different conditions on takeoff performance will be discussed. Before starting into the details of the takeoff performance adjustments, there will be a brief discussion on the differences between a slippery and a contaminated runway. A slippery runway is a runway with a reduced tire to ground friction capability due to the presence of water, ice, compact snow, or other substances. A slippery runway only affects the airplane's ability to decelerate. A slippery runway does not affect the airplane's ability to accelerate. On the other hand, a contaminated runway affects the ability of the airplane to accelerate as well as decelerate. This would include runways contaminated by a measurable depth of slush, snow, or standing water. This runway contamination creates a drag force which resists the airplane's ability to accelerate. Runway contamination also reduces the tire to ground friction and therefore affects the airplane's ability to decelerate and stop. Before we go into the detailed performance adjustments, let's spend a few minutes looking at why performance adjustments are applied. Both JAA and FAA airplane flight manuals contain field length limited takeoff weights based on a dry, smooth runway with maximum manual braking. They do not include credit for the use of reverse thrust. To illustrate why performance adjustments are used, let's take a brief look at the effect of using normal dry runway field length limited takeoff weights when the runway is contaminated with slush. For example, on a dry runway, a 70,000 kilogram airplane would have a balanced field length of about 6,100 feet and a V1 speed of 138 knots. If a takeoff was performed on a runway covered with 6 millimeters of slush using the normal dry runway dispatch data, the following would be the prediction for an emergency stop or the continued takeoff following an engine failure. In the event of an emergency stop from V1 of 138 knots, we would predict an increase in stopping distance of about 6,000 feet even considering the benefits of one engine reverse thrust. A better way to look at this effect is that the speed at the departure end of the runway would be approximately 120 knots. If the decision is to continue the takeoff following an engine failure one second before V1, the height at the end of the runway would be about 20 feet instead of the normal 35 feet. Since the available runway cannot be increased to accommodate these different conditions, we provide weight reductions and V1 adjustments to determine a reduced takeoff weight which can safely be operated from the same runway. The weight adjustments result in a reduced weight and adjusted V1 speed. This reduced weight and adjusted V1 speed require the same distance as the baseline dry runway condition. As with other airplanes your airline operates, the FAA or JAA approved airplane flight manuals contain dry runway performance. Unlike your other airplanes, the FAA and JAA approved airplane flight manuals may contain field length limited takeoff weights, which take into account a wet runway and a wet skid resistant runway.
The JAA-approved airplane flight manual also includes advisory data, which accounts for a runway covered with slush, snow, and wet ice. This slush, snow, and ice-covered runway data is not part of the FAA-approved airplane flight manual, but is still provided to the operator in the form of weight reductions and V1 adjustments in the performance in-flight section of the Quick Reference Handbook as tabular data as well as in an operational computer program. Any of these data sources can be used to create required operational data. As discussed earlier, the dry runway fuel length limited weight performance is based on the longer of the all-engine accelerate go distance to 35 feet plus 15% or the engine inoperative accelerate go distance to 35 feet, or the accelerate stop distance, assuming a maximum effort stop on a dry runway with no credit for reverse thrust. If the runway is wet, not dry, and the dry runway performance weight and V1 speed is used, the following would be the result. The all-engine distance to 35 feet would not change because a wet runway does not affect the airplane's acceleration. The engine in operative accelerate go distance to 35 feet would not change for the same reason. But the accelerate stop distance would increase because the stopping capability is degraded due to the reduction in tire-to-ground friction on a wet runway. As we can see on the graphic, if the airplane flight manual dry runway limited weight and V1 speed are used on a wet runway, the airplane may not have the ability to stop on the runway. In the airplane flight manual calculations for wet runway, we are allowed to use different assumptions in computing the performance. The wet runway engine inoperative accelerate go distance is computed based on a reduced screen height of 15 feet. As mentioned before, the accelerate stop distance required is increased due to the reduction of tire to ground friction on a wet runway surface. But the airplane flight manual wet runway stopping performance takes credit for reverse thrust on one engine. Taking credit for 15-foot screen height and one engine reverse thrust reduces the effect that the wet runway has on the fuel length required. To further reduce the effect of wet runway takeoff performance, the calculation rebalances go and stop to obtain a new lower wet runway V1 speed. The combination of a wet runway, 15 feet screen height, credit for one engine reverse thrust, and the rebalancing to a wet runway V1 speed still results in a takeoff distance longer than the airplane flight manual dry runway calculation. Therefore, the allowable field length limited takeoff weight on a wet runway will be less than the normal field length limited weight on a dry runway. Separate takeoff performance charts are provided in the Operations Manual and the Flight Planning and Performance Manual to calculate the wet runway fuel length limited weight and the wet runway V1 speeds. The wet runway fuel length limit weight will typically be lower than the dry runway fuel length limit weight. The wet runway balanced V1 speed will typically be lower than dry runway balanced V1 speed by 5 to 12 knots at the same weight, altitude, and temperature. Because V1 speed is reduced for the wet runway performance, the chance of V1 speed being limited by V1 MCG is increased. Even when the runway is wet, the airplane would be limited by minimum field length only on a very short runway.
The charts in the operations manual and the flight planning and performance manual are used in the same way as the charts for dry runway takeoff calculations. As mentioned earlier, unlike older models, the airplane flight manual now contains fuel length limited takeoff performance based on a wet skid resistant runway. A wet skid resistant runway is commonly known as a wet grooved or a porous friction course runway. The airplane flight manual allows use of the wet skid resistant performance on runways constructed and maintained to meet FAA advisory guidelines. Separate takeoff performance charts are provided in the operations manual and the flight planning and performance manual to calculate the wet skid resistant fuel length limited weight and the wet skid resistant V1 speeds. The wet skid resistant runway fuel length limit weight is typically lower than the dry runway fuel length limit weight by less than 1,000 kilograms. In fact, in many cases, there will not be any weight reduction due to this wet skid resistant performance. This is particularly true at low altitudes and normal temperatures. The wet skid resistant balanced V1 speed will typically be less than dry runway balanced V1 speed by 4 to 8 knots. Because V1 speed is reduced with the wet skid resistant runway performance, the chance of V1 speed being limited by V1 MCG is increased. Even when the runway is a wet skid resistant runway, the airplane would be limited by minimum fuel length only on a very, very short runway. The charts in the operations manual and the flight planning and performance manual are used in the same way as the charts for dry runway takeoff calculations. As stated earlier, both the wet runway and wet skid resistant takeoff performance are part of the airplane flight manual. Because both the wet runway and wet skid resistant takeoff performance are based on a 15 feet screen height, the use of clearway in the analysis of wet runway and wet skid resistant takeoff performance is prohibited. The obstacle clearance margin in the airplane flight manual results in the net flight path clearing the obstacle by a minimum of 15 feet. V1 improved climb is allowed with wet or wet skid resistant performance. Both the assumed temperature and D-rate method of reducing takeoff thrust may be used with wet and wet skid resistant performance. As with the wet runway data, an airplane dispatched assuming a dry runway but operating on a slippery runway would not have the ability to stop within the normal dry runway distances. The Quick Reference Handbook and the Flight Planning and Performance Manuals contain slippery runway data as a function of reported braking action. This data is presented as weight adjustments and V1 adjustments from the normal dry runway performance. V1 MCG limit weights are also presented. The data is presented at three levels of reported braking action. Good, medium, and poor. This reported braking action is based upon subjective evaluation of actual braking performance as reported by flight crews. Good is a performance level that is comparable to a wet runway and has also been used in JAA certifications for compact snow.
Pour is a performance level that is used in JAA certifications for wet, melting ice. Boeing does not correlate the airplane's performance to the runway friction measured by the runway friction measuring vehicles. The use of this slippery runway data is the same whether the data comes from the Operations Manual Performance in-flight section or the Flight Planning and Performance Manual. There are two data adjustments plus V1 MCG limit weight information provided. The data adjustments are to takeoff weight and V1 speed. These adjustments represent how much the takeoff weight must be reduced and the V1 adjusted so that the distance required for accelerate go and accelerate stop does not change. To minimize the weight adjustment, the screen height above the end of the runway is reduced from 35 to 15 feet and credit for one engine at reverse thrust is assumed during the stop calculation. The V1 MCG limit weight is the maximum weight at which the airplane can accelerate to V1 MCG speed and still stop within the field length available for the reported braking action. An example will be used to show how slippery runway data adjustments are applied. Assume takeoff data is being computed for a sea level airport with a runway 2500 meters long on a zero degree Celsius day. Further assume that for the above conditions, the climb limit weight is 70,500 kilograms and the weight limitation due to all other considerations is 77,000 kilograms and that this weight is limited by the obstacle considerations. Finally, we will assume a reported braking action of medium. First, we will look up the weight adjustment. This weight adjustment is added to the normal dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. This weight adjustment is always negative. The chart is entered with the dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. and the reported braking action, medium, for this example. Interpolate to obtain the takeoff weight adjustment. Add this negative weight adjustment to the lower of the dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. Next, we need to determine the V1 MCG limited weight and compare it to the obstacle or runway limited weight just determined. We start by entering the V1 MCG limit weight table with the field length available. Go across to the column which lists the pressure altitude and reported braking action and determine the V1 MCG limit weight. In this example, the V1 MCG limit weight would exceed 88,700 kilograms, the highest value in the table. Compare the V1 MCG limit weight and the field obstacle adjusted weight. The lower weight is the slippery runway takeoff weight due to runway considerations. In this case, the V1 MCG limited weight is not limiting. The climb limited takeoff weight must be compared to the slippery runway limited takeoff weight. The lower weight will be the allowable takeoff weight. For this example, the climb limit weight is still the most limiting. Next, the V1 speed must be computed. For this example, assume that the takeoff weight will be performed at the climb limit weight of 70,500 kilograms. 
Please recall that for this example, the climb limit weight is less than the slippery runway obstacle or runway limit weight. The first step is to obtain the normal dry runway takeoff speeds for the planned takeoff weight. These speeds can come from the performance in-flight section of the QRH or from the FMC. Next, enter the V1 adjustment chart at the actual weight, pressure altitude, and reported braking action. Look up the V1 adjustment, in this case a negative 15 knots. Adjust V1 by the amount in the table. Compare the resulting V1 to V1 MCG obtained from the QRH. If the resulting V1 is less than V1 MCG, set V1 to V1 MCG. In our example, no adjustment is required. Finally, the slippery runway V1 would be entered into the FMC. The slippery runway takeoff weight and V1 speed computed using the described method will result in the same takeoff distance as required by the original dry runway weight. The difference is that at this reduced weight and V1 speed, the airplane will reach a screen height of 15 feet instead of 35 feet following an engine failure at the critical speed. The airplane should also be able to stop on a slippery runway with reduced braking action if maximum manual braking and at least one engine reverse thrust is used. Notice that the weight and V1 adjustments are much larger at reported braking actions of poor. The slippery runway adjustments are valid for all flap settings. As shown earlier, an airplane dispatched assuming dry runway but operating on a slush covered runway would not have the ability to stop from V1 within the normal dry runway distances nor would it reach 35 feet within the available distance following a failure of the critical engine. The Quick Reference Handbook and the Flight Planning and Performance Manual contain takeoff performance data for runways contaminated with slush or standing water. Slush on the runway will reduce the airplane's capability to accelerate and it will also reduce the airplane's ability to stop. While accelerating, the aircraft tires displace the slush. The displacement of the slush creates a drag force which reduces the airplane's acceleration. As the airplane accelerates to a higher speed, the spray from the displaced slush will start impinging on parts of the fuselage or wings, creating even higher slush drag force. The slush drag force goes up with the square of the ground speed. The slush drag force peaks just above the hydroplaning speed and then decreases with further speed increase. Hydroplaning speed is the speed when the tire starts to lift out of the slush. The drag forces due to slush displacement and impingement begin to decrease at this speed. If the airplane must do an emergency stop, the stopping force due to the wheel brakes will be greatly reduced due to the reduction in tire to ground friction. This is particularly true at high speeds where the tires will hydroplane. A runway is contaminated when over 25% of the available runway is covered with a measurable depth of slush or standing water.
The Quick Reference Handbook and the Flight Planning and Performance Manual contain data for slush depths of 2 mm, 6 mm, and 13 mm. Takeoff is not recommended in depths greater than 13 mm due to the possibility of damage as a result of spray impingement on the airplane structure. The takeoff data provided for slush and standing water take into account the effect that the slush has on the airplane's ability to accelerate, as well as the effect on the airplane's ability to stop. As with the slippery and wet runway data, the effect of slush takeoff weight is minimized by using a reduced screen height of 15 feet for the engine inoperative accelerate go distance and credit for one engine reverse thrust on the stop. A new V1 speed is also computed. Even with the reduced screen height, credit for reverse thrust and with a new V1 speed, the weight reductions due to slush are extremely large. The slush and standing water data is presented in the Quick Reference Handbook and the Flight Planning and Performance Manual in the Performance In-Flight section. It is in the same format as the slippery runway data. There are two data adjustments plus V1 MCG limit weight information provided. The data adjustments are for takeoff weight and the V1 speed. These adjustments represent how much the takeoff weight must be reduced and V1 adjusted so that the distance required for accelerate go and accelerate stop will not change. As mentioned previously, to minimize the weight reduction, the screen height above the end of the runway is reduced from 35 to 15 feet and credit for one engine at reverse thrust is assumed during the stop calculation. The V1 MCG limit weight is the maximum weight at which the airplane can accelerate to V1 MCG speed and still stop within the fuel length available for the assumed reported braking action. An example will be used to show how slush or standing water covered runway data adjustments are applied. In this example, takeoff data is being computed for a sea level airport which has a 2500 meter long runway on a zero degree Celsius day. The climb limited weight is 70,500 kilograms and the weight limitation due to all other considerations is 77,000 kilograms and this weight is limited by the obstacle consideration. Finally, the runway is reported to be covered with 6 mm of slush. First, the weight adjustment would be determined. This weight adjustment is added to the normal dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. The chart is entered with the dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. and the reported slush depth. This example will be 6 mm. Interpolate to obtain the takeoff weight adjustment. The takeoff weight adjustment is then added to the dry runway fuel length or obstacle limited weight. Notice that the weight adjustment is always negative. Next, we need to determine the V1 MCG limited weight and compare it to the obstacle or runway limited weight just determined. We start by entering the V1 MCG limit weight table with the field length available. Go across to the column which lists the pressure altitude and reported slush depth and determine the V1 MCG limit weight. In this example, the V1 MCG limit weight would exceed 93,200 kilograms, the highest value in the table. Compare the V1 MCG limit weight and the field obstacle adjusted weight.
The lower weight is the 6 mm slush covered runway adjusted takeoff weight due to runway considerations. In this case, the V1 MCG limited weight is not limiting. The climb limited weight must be compared to the adjusted contaminated runway limited takeoff weight. The lower value will be the maximum allowable takeoff weight. For this example, the slush covered runway weight is limiting. Next, the V1 speed must be computed. For this example, the takeoff will be performed at the 6 mm slush covered runway weight of 66,200 kg. The first step is to obtain the normal dry runway takeoff speeds for the planned takeoff weight. These speeds can come from the performance in flight section of the QRH or from the FMC. Next, enter the V1 adjustment chart at the weight, pressure altitude, and reported runway condition. Look up the V1 adjustment, in this case a negative 13 knots. Adjust V1 by the amount in the table. Compare the resulting V1 to V1 MCG obtained from the QRH. If the resulting V1 is less than V1 MCG, set V1 equal to V1 MCG. In our example, no adjustment is required. Finally, the 6 mm slush covered runway V1 would be entered into the FMC. The slush covered runway takeoff weight and V1 speed computed using the described method will result in the same takeoff distance as required by the original dry runway weight. The difference is, at this reduced weight and V1 speed, the airplane will reach a screen height of 15, not 35 feet, following an engine failure at the critical speed. The airplane should also be able to stop on a runway with slush, with the use of maximum manual braking and one engine reverse thrust. The slush weight reductions and V1 adjustments take into account the reduction in tire to ground friction and the effect of hydroplaning on the airplane's stopping performance. There is no additional adjustment required for reported braking action. Notice that the weight reductions are much larger at greater slush depths. Also, the adjustments are valid for all flap settings. There are some other considerations on the use of the performance adjustments provided in the Quick Reference Handbook and the Flight Planning and Performance Manual for a slippery or slush covered runway. As stated many times, the slippery or slush covered runway performance adjustments are based on a 15 foot screen height. If the slippery or slush covered runway performance adjustments are applied to dry runway, fuel length limit weight, which takes credit for clearway, height over the end of the runway following an engine failure at the critical point, will be lower than 15 feet. In fact, the height over the end of the runway could be as low as zero at the liftoff end of the runway. Assumed temperature reduced thrust is not allowed on a runway contaminated with slush, standing water, ice, or snow. Assumed temperature reduced thrust is allowed on a wet runway if suitable performance is scheduled to account for the increased stopping distance. 
Derate is allowed on a contaminated or wet runway. In fact, there are times when derate can be used to increase the takeoff weight on contaminated or slippery runways. Yes, that is correct. In special cases, lower thrust means more takeoff weight. This is explained in the section on reduced thrust. As we have seen earlier, the slippery and slush covered weight reductions are applied to the more limiting of the field length or obstacle limited weight. This weight reduction, along with the associated V1 adjustment, results in the reduced weight, taking the same engine out continued takeoff distance to reach 15 feet as the original dry runway weight took to reach 35 feet. This ensures that all obstacles are cleared by a minimum of 15 feet. In the case where the weight reduction is small, the obstacle clearance would be slightly higher than 15 feet. For example, when the slippery runway data labeled as good is used. In the case where the weight reduction is large, the obstacle clearance would be much higher than 15 feet because of the higher climb gradient capability at a lower weight. For example, when the slush covered runway data is used. The previous sections have covered the wet, slippery, and contaminated runway performance data available in the operations manual and the flight planning and performance manual. Boeing also provides this data to your airline in the form of a computer program. Your airline may choose to use this program to create runway analysis for any of the previously discussed cases and for dry snow of up to 4 inches. In many cases, the computer program will result in higher takeoff weights because of the increased precision in the calculation. The computer program uses the same assumption of a reduced height at the end of the runway of 15 feet. The program also allows credit for reverse thrust. The computer program will result in net flight path clearing the obstacle by at least 15 feet. The normal airplane performance presented in the Airplane Flight Manual, Operations Manual, and Flight Planning and Performance Manual is based on the assumption that all equipment is operating normally. There may be occasions when the airplane has inoperative or missing equipment. In these cases, the airplane can be dispatched under the guidelines of the Minimum Equipment List or the Configuration Deviation List. The master MEL provides authorization for the operation of the airplane with inoperative equipment. The CDL provides authorization for the operation of the airplane with missing external items. There are many items in the MEL and CDL which affect the airplane's performance. In this section, two items which affect the airplane's field length and obstacle performance will be discussed. The first item is anti-skid inoperative. The second item is one thrust reverser inoperative. If the anti-skid is inoperative or deactivated per the MEL, the airplane's wheel braking performance will be greatly reduced. This is because the normal anti-skid protection is not available. This reduction in wheel braking capability can be accounted for by computing new takeoff data based on anti-skid inoperative. Another option is to apply a simple conservative weight reduction and V1 adjustment provided in the QRH. This simple weight reduction and V1 adjustment is found in the text section of the Performance In-Flight section of the QRH.
The following example will show how the anti-skid inoperative data adjustments are applied. Assume takeoff data is being computed for a sea level airport with a runway 2500 meters long on a zero degree Celsius day. The climb limit weight is 70,500 kilograms. The weight limitation due to all other considerations is 77,000 kilograms and that weight is limited by the obstacle considerations. Finally, the anti-skid is inoperative. First, the weight reduction would be determined by finding the value in the text. Reduce the normal dry runway or obstacle limited weight by the value from the text. The weight reduction for your configuration could be larger or smaller than the example we are using here. This anti-skid inoperative limited fuel length obstacle weight is compared to the normal climb limited weight. The allowable takeoff weight is the lower value of 70,400 kilograms. Next, the V1 speed must be adjusted. For this example, the takeoff will be performed at the anti-skid inoperative runway limited weight of 70,400 kilograms. The first step is to obtain the normal dry runway takeoff speeds for the planned takeoff weight. These speeds can come from the performance in-flight section of the Quick Reference Handbook or from the FMC. The normal V1 speed from the QRH or FMC would be further reduced by the V1 adjustment presented in the anti-skid inoperative V1 decrement table. Enter the table with the fuel length available. In this case, the V1 adjustment is 13 knots. This would be subtracted from the normal dry runway V1 speed. Compare the resulting V1 to V1 MCG obtained from the QRH. In this case, there is not a problem because the anti-skid inoperative V1 is greater than the V1 MCG. If the resulting anti-skid inoperative V1 speed had been below V1 MCG, takeoff is still permitted with V1 set equal to V1 MCG, provided that the dry runway accelerate stop distance corrected for wind and slope exceeds the value listed in the QRH. Finally, the anti-skid inoperative V1 would be entered into the FMC. Detailed analysis for the specific case from the airplane flight manual may yield a less restrictive penalty. The normal airplane performance presented in the Airplane Flight Manual, Operations Manual, and Flight Planning and Performance Manual is based on the assumption that all equipment is operating normally. There may be occasions when the airplane has inoperative or missing equipment. In these cases, the airplane can be dispatched under the guidelines of the Minimum Equipment List or the Configuration Deviation List. The master MEL provides authorization for the operation of the airplane with inoperative equipment. The CDL provides authorization for the operation of the airplane with missing external items. There are many items in the MEL and CDL which affect the airplane's performance. In this section, two items which affect the airplane's fuel length and obstacle performance will be discussed.
The first item is anti-skid inoperative. The second item is one thrust reverser inoperative. If the anti-skid is inoperative or deactivated per the MEL, the airplane's wheel braking performance will be greatly reduced. This is because the normal anti-skid protection is not available. This reduction in wheel braking capability can be accounted for by computing new takeoff data based on anti-skid inoperative. Another option is to apply a simple conservative weight reduction and V1 adjustment provided in the QRH. This simple weight reduction and V1 adjustment is found in the text section of the performance in-flight section of the QRH. The following example will show how the anti-skid inoperative data adjustments are applied. Assume takeoff data is being computed for a sea level airport with a runway 2500 meters long on a zero degree Celsius day. The climb limit weight is 70,500 kilograms. The weight limitation due to all other considerations is 77,000 kilograms and that weight is limited by the obstacle considerations. Finally, the anti-skid is inoperative. First, the weight reduction would be determined by finding the value in the text. Reduce the normal dry runway or obstacle limited weight by the value from the text. The weight reduction for your configuration could be larger or smaller than the example we are using here. This anti-skid inoperative limited fuel length obstacle weight is compared to the normal climb limited weight. The allowable takeoff weight is the lower value of 70,400 kilograms. Next, the V1 speed must be adjusted. For this example, the takeoff will be performed at the anti-skid inoperative runway limited weight of 70,400 kilograms. The first step is to obtain the normal dry runway takeoff speeds for the planned takeoff weight. These speeds can come from the performance in-flight section of the Quick Reference Handbook or from the FMC. The normal V1 speed from the QRH or FMC would be further reduced by the V1 adjustment presented in the anti-skid inoperative V1 decrement table. Enter the table with the fuel length available. In this case, the V1 adjustment is 13 knots. This would be subtracted from the normal dry runway V1 speed. Compare the resulting V1 to V1 MCG obtained from the QRH. In this case, there is not a problem because the anti-skid inoperative V1 is greater than the V1 MCG. If the resulting anti-skid inoperative V1 speed had been below V1 MCG, takeoff is still permitted with V1 set equal to V1 MCG, provided that the dry runway accelerate stop distance corrected for wind and slope exceeds the value listed in the QRH. Finally, the anti-skid inoperative V1 would be entered into the FMC. Detailed analysis for the specific case from the airplane flight manual may yield a less restrictive penalty.
The lower anti-skid inoperative limit of weight and V1 speed will result in the same takeoff distance as the normal dry runway weight. The anti-skid inoperative performance is based on the normal 35-foot screen height for the continued acceleration following an engine failure. The anti-skid inoperative performance does not take credit for reverse thrust. Anti-skid inoperative performance is allowed on a dry runway only. The use of assumed temperature is not allowed when an anti-skid is inoperative. The use of D-rate is allowed with an anti-skid inoperative. In fact, D-rate could result in an increase in allowable takeoff weight if the airplane is limited by V1 MCG. As presented in earlier modules, the wet runway and wet skid resistant runway takeoff data takes credit for reverse thrust on one engine. The slippery and contaminated runway data also take credit for reverse thrust on one engine. If you are dispatching with one thrust reverser inoperative or deactivated, the airplane stopping capability will be reduced on slippery, contaminated, or wet runways. The operational computer program is capable of computing takeoff performance with a reverser inoperative for all runway conditions previously discussed. The QRH provides weight adjustments for the case where a thrust reverser is an operative on a wet or wet skid resistant runway. The QRH does not provide weight adjustments for the case where a thrust reverser is an operative on a slippery or contaminated runway. The one reverser inoperative data in the QRH is presented as a simple weight reduction and V1 adjustment in Section 1. This simple weight reduction is taken from the wet or wet skid resistant runway limited weight as appropriate. The normal wet or wet skid resistant takeoff speeds would then be looked up in the QRH or FMC at the reduced one reverser in operative weight. The normal wet or wet skid resistant V1 speed from the QRH or FMC would be further reduced by the V1 adjustment presented in the QRH text. Because V1 has been reduced, the chance of being limited by V1 MCG is increased. If the resulting one reverser in operative V1 speed is less than V1 MCG, takeoff is still permitted with V1 set equal to V1 MCG, provided that the wet runway accelerate stop distance corrected for wind and slope exceeds the value listed in the QRH. Detailed analysis for the specific case from the operational computer program may result in a less restrictive penalty. This module will discuss the use of clearway and stopway and the Boeing data you can use to determine your takeoff speeds when using clearway, stopway, or a combination of the two. Clearway is defined as an area beyond the liftoff end of the runway that is at least 500 feet wide. It is centrally located about the extended center line of the runway. It is controlled by the airport authority. And no object or terrain in the clearway projects above a plane sloped upward from the end of the runway with a gradient of 1.25%, except for threshold lights that are located to each side of the runway.
For a dry runway, regulations allow the point at which the airplane reaches 35 feet altitude to be moved from the end of the runway into the clearway. The maximum takeoff weight of an airplane may be increased by increasing the takeoff distance available when calculating engine out, accelerate go, and all engine field length limited weights. Regulations do restrict the amount of clearway that may be used. The limit on clearway is defined in terms of the flare distance of the airplane. The flare distance is the distance along the ground from the point where the airplane is at the liftoff speed to the point where the airplane is 35 feet above the runway. Regulations limit the amount of clearway that may be used to one half of the flare distance. Regulations do not allow the use of clearway when calculating wet runway takeoff performance. Stopway is an area beyond the liftoff end of the runway. That is at least as wide as the runway. It is centrally located about the extended center line of the runway. It has been designated by the airport authorities for use in decelerating an airplane during a rejected takeoff. It is able to support the airplane during an aborted takeoff without causing structural damage to the airplane. Stopway may be used to increase the field length limit takeoff weight by increasing the accelerate stop distance available for takeoff performance calculations. There is no limit on the length of stopway that may be used in calculating field length limited takeoff weight, except that V1 may never exceed VR. If the length of the allowable clearway is greater than the stopway available, and if you are operating at a takeoff limit weight that has been calculated using clearway and stopway, the V1 speed determined from the Quick Reference Handbook or from the Flight Management Computer must be reduced. The field length limited takeoff weight has been increased by taking advantage of the allowable clearway. The requirement to be able to stop that increased weight on the stopping surface in the event of a rejected takeoff must still be met. The stopping requirement is satisfied by reducing the QRH and FMC value of V1. If you are operating at a takeoff limit weight that has been calculated using clearway and stopway, and if the allowable clearway is less than the stopway available, the V1 speed must be increased above the Quick Reference Handbook and FMC V1. In this case, the field length limit takeoff weight has been increased by taking advantage of the increased stopping distance available. Now, to ensure that the airplane can complete the takeoff in the takeoff distance available following an engine failure, the V1 speed must be increased. If you are operating at a performance limited takeoff weight that has been calculated using any combination of clearway and stopway, and your takeoff speeds have been determined using the Quick Reference Handbook or Flight Management Computer Information, you must adjust your V1 speed using information provided in the Performance In-Flight section of your QRH. Information is provided in two parts. V1 adjustments, and maximum allowable clearway.
V1 adjustment information is presented in terms of clearway minus stopway. The actual condition of the runway you intend to use and in terms of the normal dry or wet runway V1. The maximum length of clearway that you may use is listed in the maximum allowable clearway table. Note that no V1 adjustments are shown for positive values of clearway minus stopway and wet runway because use of clearway on a wet runway is not permitted. Suppose you are determining takeoff speeds for a dry runway that is 2,000 meters long with 200 meters of clearway and 300 meters of stopway. You have determined that your performance limited takeoff weight is 67,300 kilograms and your speeds for that weight from the QRH are V1 is 137 knots, VR is 138 knots, and V2 is 143 knots. Let's determine the V1 speed adjustment required. First, determine the maximum amount of clearway you are allowed to use. In this case, with 2,000 meters of runway, you can use 120 meters of the 200 meters of clearway available at your airport. Next, enter the speed adjustments table with clearway minus stopway. And find the condition of the runway you intend to use. Enter with the normal V1 speed for your planned takeoff weight. Read the V1 adjustment at the intersection of the row and column. Add the V1 adjustment to the V1 that you previously determined from the standard takeoff speeds table for your takeoff weight and airport conditions. Remember that V1 can never exceed VR. In this case, we must reduce the adjusted V1 to be equal to VR. The new V1 speed is 138 knots. Therefore, your speeds are 138 knots, 138 knots, and 143 knots.